Hello again everybody. So we've been talking about glacier structure or anatomy and in the last video we just made the point that the characteristics of a glacier vary with depth from the surface through to the bed and that therefore we might predict that the behaviour of a glacier is also going to vary with depth because of those changing characteristics. So for example changes in temperature are going to have an impact on the flow law parameter. I want to carry on now and look at supraglacial features and phenomena. In other words, just have a look at what's going on right at the surface of the glacier and some of the, char the characteristics or controls that determine the morphology of glacier surface features. So this photograph shows the summit ice cap of the volcano Cotopaxi in Ecuador and it illustrates quite nicely one of the key controls on what the surface of a glacier looks like which is the position that you're at relative to the equilibrium line. In other words are you in the accumulation zone or are you in the ablation zone? And if you're in the ablation zone for at least part of the year there's going to be a season with bare ice at the surface. The snow will have melted off uh, in, in, the, in the summer. So here for example in the lower part of the, the ice cap you can see bare ice and in the photograph on the left that's actually from Greenland uh, but you can see there a bit of the surface of the Greenland ice sheet in the ablation zone in the summer and all the snow that fell the previous um, the previous winter has, has melted away revealing the ice beneath and the ice itself is now melting away in that ablation zone. By contrast up in the accumulation zone in most glaciers, well, in, in any healthy and uh, any glacier with a prospect of much survival time, there should be year round snow cover in the accumulation zone because the snow that falls each winter doesn't melt away uh, the following summer. So the accumulation zone, typically you'd expect to have a snow covered surface in the ablation zone for at least part of the year, you'll have bare ice. And in these slides I'm, I'm going to focus really on the ablation zone just because you can see more clearly what's going on there. And one of the first controls on the morphology of a glacier surface, uh, we need to look at strain and dynamic effects, in other words the movement of the glacier. And the most obvious, the most obvious effect uh, of, of strain or movement uh, at the glacier surface are crevasses which open up in response to uh, extending strain. The presence or absence of crevasses and the orientation of crevasses tell us about the strain pattern on the glacier surface. So in this picture in the bottom left where I'm standing across that crevasse, the principal extending strain is from left to right or right to left across the image. This is a photograph out of the aeroplane window on, onto the edge of the ice sheet in West Greenland and it picks out uh, an interesting contrast between a glacier here which is um, or an outlet here which is ending as a floating terminus in this ice marginal lake and as the ice uh, comes down up over the rays and then down into the water the acceleration of the glacier margin into the water here is leading to extension and the formation of transverse crevasses crevasses running across uh, the line of the, uh, across the line of flow here as the glacier is extending in this direction uh, in, into the lake by contrast here another uh, section of outlet here ending on land so there isn't that acceleration into the into the low friction um, base as there is in this location and here we don't have those that we don't have that pattern of crevasses so we can see a difference in the surface flow pattern from which we can infer or we can see here the evidence of differences in dynamics here we can read that difference in dynamics just by noting that we don't have those crevasse patterns at the surface as well as crevasses that you can pick up here as the ice comes uh, down the steep slope around this nun attack you, you can tell that the, the the ground level is higher on this side then there's a steep drop down to down to this side you can see the streams running across the uh, the protruding ice mass through the ice cap here through, through the glacier here and so you can see crevasses at various points on the glacier surface indicating the extending flow and the faster flow but you can also see these other features over here these ogives and I'll say a little bit about how ogives are formed uh, in just a minute but it's, it's, it's another feature which reflects flow or dynamic characteristics uh, within the ice being picked up and recorded in surface morphology. As with most things that we're talking about in this module there's lots of literature out there for you to look up uh, how, how, how ogives work but I thought I'd just give you a little sketch to illustrate one way of understanding the basic process. So imagine we have a situation with a, a rock step underneath the glacier and therefore 
an ice fall where as the ice accelerates, extends, crevasses form just over that ice fall area and the ice moves through that over the course of time. So you can imagine packets of ice moving through the ice fall at different points during the year, during the summer, when the ice moves through the ice fall, crevasses are opening up. That opening up of crevasses over the ice fall is going to lead to enhanced melting because rather like weathering in a rock, the more joints, the more cracks, uh, the more fractures you open up, the more surface area you have exposed to the warmer summer conditions at this time of year. And so we're going to have enhanced melting. So as that packet of ice makes its way downstream past the, uh, the ice fall, when it gets down to this area, it will have experienced, relative to the ice on either side of it that's gone through the ice fall in winter, a greater amount of ablation, lowering the surface. By contrast, the next piece of ice, if you like, the, nice, the, the next section of ice that goes through the following winter, when we don't have so much ablation happening and the surface might be snow covered depending on where we are, so we don't have this enhanced ablation, we still have the crevassing, but we don't have the ablation happening so much at that time of year, so we don't have the enhancement to the ablation. So as that portion of ice moves through, this portion moves further down glacier, this new portion moves to here, and this portion hasn't experienced that enhanced ablation. The next portion to come through comes through in the summer, so we get the enhanced ablation. The next portion, winter, no ablation. So over the course of several years, we have downstream portions of the glacier, portions of ice which haven't, which have been through during summer and have had the enhanced ablation, and portions that have been through in the winter and haven't had the enhanced ablation. And that's one way to get your head around some of the literature that you can read on how ogives form downstream of uh, ice falls in this kind of situation. We can also think about the effects of meltwater at the glacier surface. A glacier surface, like, like any landscape, can be subject to erosion, transport, deposition, not only mechanical erosion of the ice, but also thermal erosion uh, of the ice if, if the water is, is warmer than the ice is, depending on, depending on the water source here. But a lot of the glacier surface in the ablation zone is affected uh, by meltwater flow. Um, we get some very interesting meltwater effects on glacier surfaces. And in this image, going back to that nun attack I showed you before, again, we're in, in, near close to the ice sheet margin in West Greenland near Kangalusuak here. And again, you can see crevasses, you can see ogives here coming in from the right hand side, and you can see lots of meltwater on the glacier surface also. Another important effect to think about on the glacier surface is differential melting. A lot of the, um, the gross morphology of, the, of, of a glacier surface in the ablation zone is due to the ablation, the melting, but it doesn't happen evenly across the whole glacier surface as a geographical pattern to the, to the distribution of, of specific uh, ablation. So for example, here on the right hand side, we have a, a boulder on the glacier surface, which is protecting the ice immediately underneath it from the sun. So while the surrounding ice is being melted away, this little pedestal is forming underneath the rock, uh, indicating that differential ablation. Here's a, this is in, in, in Greenland and here in the bottom right is a, uh, a similar feature in Ecuador and at this point on the glacier surface, this was in um, on Cotopaxi again, uh, but at this point on the glacier surface the, the rocks on top of their little ice pedestals are, are, are protecting the ice from essentially overhead uh, sunlight and so we have this long thin column of ice growing in, in, a, in a very specific shaded zone underneath the, uh, the boulders and the pebbles. Here's a slightly different example where there's a meltwater stream on the glacier surface. One side of the, of, of the valley, the, ch the channel, is, is on the sunny side, the sunny slope. The other side is on the, the shady slope, and the shady slope isn't being affected by the sunshine, whereas the sunny slope is being melted back, and you have a, a very asymmetrical channel form here because of that differential ablation on the sunny and shady si sides of the channel. Another feature that we can associate partly with differential melting uh, is cryokonite or cryokonite holes. And these occur partly for, for 
partly because of biological activity that can occur within the meltwater, within the holes, but initially they're set off in many situations by items on the glacier surface, dark coloured items or items that can absorb the heat from the sun, burning their way or melting their way into the glacier as they absorb the heat. It's a, a classic um, A-level experiment from when I did geography at school, uh, that you put some light and dark coloured pebbles on a glacier surface or some big and small um, pebbles on, on, on a, an ice surface and you shine a, a heat lamp at them or put them out in the sun and the dark coloured material absorbs the sunlight and starts melting its way into the ice. The light coloured material reflects and so the, the light coloured pebbles don't burn their way into the ice so much. The smaller pebbles burn their way in because they can transmit the heat through through to the ice. If you put a larger boulder on, then as you saw in the previous picture, rather than transmitting the sun's heat through to the ice and melting its way in, a larger particle will protect the ice underneath and form a pedestal. So it used to be a, a, a classic little undergraduate experiment in the old days where we'd get different color, color, different colored pebbles and different sizes of pebbles and boulders to try to work out what the critical threshold was between making a pedestal and making a, a cryoconite hole. There's a, a substantial and very interesting literature about what goes on in these cryoconite holes and the idea that a lot of their uh, survival and their perpetuation within, uh, within the glacier is due to biological activity uh, with, within the um, microbial communities within, within, the, within the cryoconites. Uh, and that's something you can read up on if it's something you, th you, you would find interesting. A related differential melt phenomenon uh, is the dirt cone, which much like the difference between cryoconite where a small amount of debris will melt its way into the glacier and a rock pedestal where a large amount of debris will protect the ice underneath it. The same is true when dirt gathers on a glacier surface. So here at Solheimerkel, those of you who know the glacier will see that this photograph was taken a long time ago before its recent uh, significant retreat. But on Solheimjökull, there's a lot of volcanic tephra uh, washing around on the surface. Where this tephra gets washed, this volcanic ash gets washed into uh, into hollows or into, into puddles on the glacier surface and builds up as a, a protective cover covering. As the ice surface generally melts down uh, under ablation, little patches of dirt protect the areas of ice underneath them to make these dirt cones, which are little little cones of ice that are protected by their individual layers uh, of, of protective dirt. So with the dirt cones, if we have a glacier surface and there are some low points and high points and a bit of debris gathers uh, in a low point, so a little puddle of debris on the glacier surface, that debris protects the ice immediately underneath it from ablation. So the surrounding area is a areas of ice melt away more, that little patch of ice melts away less the debris covers the ice as it's being exposed and over the course of time we find ourselves with a situation like this where we have our regular glacier surface but then the raised area, the dirt cone, where the debris is protecting the ice uh, from melting. And here are a few uh, examples of different uh, dirt cones from the surface of, of Solheimjökull. And the, the morphology or the form of, of, of the ice that makes up the heart of the cone tells you about why the debris was gathered there in the first place. So here we have what used to be the bottom of a crevasse uh, and lots of dirt would have gathered in that crevasse. The ice around it has subsequently melted away, leaving behind little, little towers of ice covered in debris until glacial geomorphologists come along and scrape or wash all the debris off. Uh, so you can see here before we clean it off uh, and it looks like a pile of dirt but then when you clean it off it turns out to be ice with a thin coating of dirt rather than a big pile of dirt. Likewise this one looks like a pile of dirt with, a, with some kind of dirt chimney in it. Well what we have here is the bottom of a, a meltwater escape channel, a moulin, uh, a meltwater pathway down into the glacier. When the glacier was much higher a meltwater pipe came down into the ice. Subsequently that filled up with debris. The surrounding ice melted away under ablation and this area where the the pipe full of debris was that debris emerges from the pipe as it melts away, falls out onto the surface, makes a protective layer, and we have this little volcano-shaped uh, dirt cone. 
Certainly at this scale, these aren't massively important features, although you can get much bigger versions of them. But they're, a ni they're an interesting illustration of some of the interactions that are going on between ice, debris, melting, no melting, these, these geographical variations in ablation that can have an impact on the morphology of a glacier surface. So just to finish off this, this, this unit, Glacier characteristics vary with depth. Lots of different things are going to be varying from the, the surface of the glacier through the interior down to the bed. We, we've only touched on a few of them in any, in any detail. And therefore, glacier behavior, the characteristics of the ice, and therefore the behavior of the ice vary with depth. This is particularly true once you get to the base ice layer, which is what we're going to talk about next. So understanding how glaciers behave in all sorts of different uh, areas, dynamics, hydrology, geomorphic impact, that requires us to understand these, these variations uh, in characteristics through the different parts of the structure of a glacier. And we've just looked in this session at a little, a little example of how even the surface morphology is controlled by a wide range of different factors, but importantly, how you can look at the surface morphology and therefore infer aspects of the dynamics or, or other parts of the glacier system. You can read one part of the system to infer characteristics of other parts of the system or of the system as a whole. That's a really important aspect of the way that geographers look at glaciers.